Well, believe it or not, I um, worried about the title of this presentation, The Elections of 1863. I'll bet some of you have been sitting there thinking that the title of my presentation today is a typographical error. <laughs> uh, you're thinking, surely, uh, Mark meant to say 1862, uh, or, or maybe 1864. Everybody knows that elections in American history come in um, two-year cycles, in even-numbered years. We call them the presidential elections and then the off-year elections. And so whoever heard of elections important enough to study 150 years later, they were held in an odd-numbered year. Um, or uh, you may have uh, thought that this is an example of the tyranny of the anniversary over historical substance. <laughs> I hope not, uh, but at any rate, the title is not a mistake. Uh, 1863 is the election year I want to uh, begin to examine today. And we've already learned, in a way, the most important lesson. And that is, when you study politics in the middle of the 19th century, you begin by throwing out all of your assumptions about the election calendar. And so three important states, including uh, the states with, uh, I think, the second and third largest electoral votes. Uh, anyway, three important states, at more than that, but three important ones, held uh, gubernatorial elections in 1863. And among other things, you want to think of these as struggles for control of the states uh, for the next year, 1864 the presidential election year. Or, or maybe you want to think, again, it's something that's a little hard for us to recapture, but think about the important role that the states played in military mobilization in the 19th century, a, a role that's greater than now. But the states were Connecticut, Pennsylvania, and Ohio. And up to now, they have been, the elections in them, have been interpreted mainly as revealing the strength of the peace movement within the Democratic Party. Uh, well, I would say that the key to understanding these elections is their timing. Remember, there really were elections, important ones in 1863, and the timing of the, those elections within 1863 is uh, a key thing to help us understand them. So, I'm going to begin with Connecticut. Um, Thomas Seymour was the Democratic nominee in Connecticut. He ran against a Republican incumbent named William Buckingham. And Seymour's nomination came early in the year, in February 1863. And at that time, the Democrats were savoring their recent victories in what we call the off-year elections in November 1862. Uh, so they nominated uh, Seymour with some confidence, I guess, uh, and he was an unapologetic peace candidate. As a member of the state legislature in Connecticut in 1861, he concluded immediately uh, that the North could not conquer the Confederacy, and from that point on, he advocated peace. But if you look at the Democratic platform in Connecticut, it wasn't nearly as straightforward as the Democratic candidate had been. And that's because I, I think they were following what was a fairly common uh, practice in the 19th century, and that is to give one wing of the party the candidate, and you give the other wing of the party the platform. They don't always match. Just ask McClellan. Uh, so in the uh, Connecticut Democratic uh, platform, uh, the word peace I don't think appears. Uh, the fourth uh, plank of the platform did say, quote, that the democracy, and incidentally people in the 19th century, especially Democrats themselves, called the party the democracy. So that the democracy of Connecticut, sympathizing with their conservative brethren of the middle and western states, pledged themselves to unite with them in the adoption of all honorable measures having in view the cessation of hostilities. Unquote. More to the point, the platform 
uh, denounced, this was a little tougher stand here, uh, the platform denounced, quote, the monstrous fallacy that the union can be restored by the armed hand, unquote. That's Seymour's idea. Well, election day in Connecticut came in April, and Seymour lost in a pretty close race. Um, this loss by no means traumatized the Democratic Party in the rest of the nation. New England was generally regarded as Republican country. Buckingham was an incumbent. And so uh, the loss was not too surprising. But the Democrats uh, did learn something useful from the campaign. And that was advocating peace was not a particularly good idea. <laughs> so the Democratic Party in Ohio and the party in Pennsylvania, when they made their nominations two months later, would likely factor that information about the appeal of peace into their decisions on candidates and platforms. Now, I'm going to put it bluntly uh, right here. Thomas Seymour was the only peace candidate nominated by the Democrats in 1863. At least the only one I can find. He may well have been the only peace gubernatorial candidate in the whole Civil War. Uh, I, I'm not sure yet. Now, I know you're thinking, I must be crazy. Uh, everyone knows that the Ohio Democrats that summer nominated Clement L. Vallandigham for governor on June 11th, 1863. But in the eyes of the Ohio Democrats who nominated Vallandigham, he was not a peace candidate. He was a civil liberties candidate. He was supposed to protest the um, dictatorship of the Lincoln administration. So what's crucial here, again, is the timing, in this case, the timing within the year 1863. The Ohio Democratic Nominating Convention met on June 11th, uh, 1863. Uh, and the expectation of the Ohio um, Democratic Central Committee and, and other uh, Democratic leaders in Ohio, uh, up to about the time of the convention, had been that the nominee would be a man named uh, Hugh J. Jewett, uh, who had run uh, previously for governor. But uh, before the convention occurred, Vallandigham had been arrested by military authorities in Ohio, it was in May, uh, for giving a political speech in Mount Vernon, Ohio, criticizing the Republican administration. The military commander of the district uh, was uh, General Ambrose Burnside. He had spies in the audience at Mount Vernon taking notes on Vallandigham's speech. And when they took them back to Burnside and he read what Vallandigham had said, he had him arrested by military authority. At Vallandigham's home in Dayton, Ohio, literally by a knock on the door in the middle of the night so that no courts would be open for him to obtain a writ of habeas corpus from a judge. Well, the arrest of a prominent Democratic politician for simply giving a political speech ignited Democratic excitement all over the nation. It led to protest, public protest meetings all over the country, and the Democrats were absolutely electrified. Vallandigham overnight became a martyr to civil liberty and freedom of speech, and in a wave of, of uh, uh, popular enthusiasm, the Ohio Democrats gave the gubernatorial nomination to him in June. He was a civil liberties candidate. The Ohio Democratic platform was long, uh, and it included seven paragraphs specifically on the arrest of Clement Vallandigham. Uh, it had other paragraphs in the platform insisting on the right of freedom of speech. And the only mention of peace in the Ohio Democratic platform of 1863 was fairly innocuous. The Ohio Democrats uh, would, they said, and I'll quote from it, they would hail with pleasure and delight any manifestation of a desire to return to the Union by the seceded states. And who wouldn't? <laughs> well, of course, 
Clement Vallandigham's personal views on peace were anything but innocuous, and they were not reflected in the Ohio platform. While a member of Congress, uh, Vallandigham had, I think, abstained from voting on appropriations for uh, the troops already in the field. Uh, and uh, he had advocated peace loudly and long. But that's not why he was nominated. He was nominated in spite of his record. And Ohio Democrats said so. George Pugh, uh, one of the Ohio Democrats, he served as uh, Vlandingham's counsel, uh, I, I think, after the arrest back in May. And uh, he said in, later in the summer, quote, I may not agree with Mr. Vlandingham in all his opinions respecting the prosecution or the conclusion of this war but I will maintain his right to express those opinions. Well, uh, another prominent Ohio Democrat, Samuel S. Cox, uh, who I think was on the same platform with Vlandingham at Mount Vernon in May, but anyway, he knew him well, uh, and he campaigned for Vlandingham uh, that summer uh, and into the fall in the gubernatorial campaign, but Cox made it clear that, quote, the only issue we make here is the right of free speech, unquote. Cox and Pew both canvassed the state of Ohio for Vallandigham, and, they, uh, and Cox uh, later informed Democratic leaders in New York, quote, personal liberty is the only issue Pew and I make. Well, that's not a tightrope everyone can walk. Uh, when attacked, the political party must rally around its candidate, no matter how obnoxious he turns out to be. And so, the Ohio Democrats did, uh, did, did just that. They rallied around Vallandigham and, uh, when he was attacked for his uh, unpopular views on peace. Now, Vlandingham, as you know, wasn't there to defend himself uh, because he had been found uh, guilty by a military commission, uh, exiled to the Confederacy. They didn't want him either. Uh, so he left there uh, by uh, a blockade runner, I think, and went to Canada, and then he remained in exile in Canada when he's nominated for uh, governor. And so he's a, surrogate, he, he's a surrogate candidate. That is, people run for him. Uh, and give speeches for him, like Cox and Pew, but he's not there to defend himself. At any rate, the bottom line here is that peace got more of a defense in Ohio than the Ohio Democrats would have given it had Jewett been the candidate as planned. But from afar, it looked as though Ohio Democrats favored peace. And Republicans, of course, did everything in their power to further that impression to make Vallandigham into a peace candidate. They were, I would say, completely successful. In the end, even Democrats in the East ended up thinking of, of Ohio, uh, of the Democrats in Ohio, as infatuated with peace, as besotted with peace. What is the matter with them out in Ohio? <laughs> and that just shows you the danger of surrogate candidates. Uh, under these peculiar circumstances, uh, uh, they run the risk of being made into what the opposition party says they are. And Republicans said that Vallandigham was a peace candidate. He lost uh, in October uh, to a man named John Bruff. Okay, the Pennsylvania Democrats. They also chose their candidate in June 1863 but fatefully, just a little later in June than the meeting of the Ohio Democratic Nominating Convention. The Pennsylvania Democrats chose their candidate uh, to run against the incumbent governor, Andrew Gregg Curtin. They chose their candidate on June 17, 1863. Uh, that's less than a week after Vallandigham's nomination. And so the Pennsylvania Democrats, <coughs> excuse me, were swept up in the enthusiasm of the Vallandigham 
uh, arrest, and they looked at Ohio and what a splendid example Ohio had presented, and so Pennsylvania uh, nominated a civil liberties candidate, too, for governor. The Pennsylvania Democrats did. The problem was, for Pennsylvania, that this state had many possible nominees, eager nominees, in fact, uh, seeking the office, uh, but they didn't have an obvious martyr to civil liberty like Vallandigham. So they decided to select a mute symbol of liberty under law, uh, of protecting freedom of speech. They decided to select a justice of the Pennsylvania State Supreme Court, a man named George Washington Woodward. So in his very uh, being, not in what he said in speeches, because Supreme Court justices were not supposed to make speeches, and they didn't. Uh, Woodward, though, would just stand there uh, and, and he, would, he would represent the judiciary that would protect civil liberties from the tyranny of the national administration. So as it turned out, Woodward might as well have been in exile in Canada. Uh, uh, because, uh, well, uh, true to expectation, uh, uh, true to the expectations of a Supreme Court justice, uh, he vowed not to campaign actively. He didn't campaign actively. He didn't make political speeches then in uh, public. And that was below the dignity of someone who occupied the Supreme Bench. Uh, the Democratic platform of Pennsylvania stressed the party's devotion to the Constitution and said explicitly, quote, Thanks are tendered to the democracy of Ohio for the vindication they have given the Constitution. So they're just following in Ohio's steps here in protecting the Constitution and freedom of speech. And all that the Pennsylvania Democrats said in their platform in 1863 about peace was this, which I think is the most innocuous of the statements in the three platforms, quote, the administration in departing from the resolutions of Congress declaring the war's paper purpose to be for restoring the Union alone has totally changed the grounds of the war and greatly delayed a just hope of an honorable peace. So, so Woodward was another candidate who, for whom uh, Democrats in the state campaigned, though he didn't campaign himself, and so guess what the Republicans did? They made of him what they wanted to, and what they wanted to make of him was another Vallandigham. They began immediately after Woodward's nomination, and if you pick up any Pennsylvania Democratic newspaper in, say, the first couple of weeks after the Woodward nomination, you'll find articles headed Vallandigham and Woodward. Uh, and, uh, uh, excuse me, that's any Republican newspaper. Uh, that's what the Republicans wanted to do, was associate Vallandigham and uh, Woodward, and well, uh, they did a good job of it. Um, Woodward lost, of course, and after the Democratic defeat, uh, one bitter Democrat in Ohio said about the Vallandigham nomination, quote, it tainted the whole party. In Pennsylvania, I know, the abolitionists kept the name of our candidate more prominent than they did Judge Woodward. So you would have thought Vallandigham was running in Pennsylvania. So the two um, civil liberties candidates were transformed by the Republicans into peace candidates forever, to this day. You can read about them from uh, even our best political historians who call them, and uh, this is just one uh, quote, he call, they call these candidates strident anti-war Democrats. Well, at this point, while I was writing this talk last week in State College, uh, I recalled that this was a Lincoln conference, uh, and uh, <laughs> I noticed that I, I hadn't mentioned Lincoln's name yet. <laughs> so um, so I, I decided I'd better do that. And, uh, and well, I can hardly believe uh, I'm saying uh, this, but, uh, you know, I, I did think well, where does Lincoln come in, into this picture in the elections of 1863? And the point I would make about it uh, is this. He did come into the picture. And, and I'm surprised that, to find myself uh, saying this, 
uh, because uh, I think that uh, Lincoln had not come into the picture before. So in other words, in the elections of 1862, Lincoln did almost nothing, and it showed. The Democrats back in 1862, I told you they were savoring their, their victory, uh, the Democrats picked up 35 seats in Congress. Uh, they won the governorship of New York in 1862. They captured the state legislatures in Indiana and Illinois. And this was an amazing feat for a political party uh, that the Republicans uh, had, uh, many of them just written off as dead, uh, uh, and a party, moreover, that many Republicans assumed, well, even if they weren't dead, they'd play dead during the war, that they would relax partisanship in this great uh, uh, crisis, and they didn't. And, uh, well, I've long been puzzled by a letter that Abraham Lincoln received shortly before those autumn elections in 1862, it came from Lyman Trumbull, uh, the, one of the Republican senators from uh, Illinois, and he wrote it on September 7th, um, 1862. And the letter warned the president, quote, the Democrats are organizing for a party contest this fall. They have called a state convention and are calling congressional and county conventions of a purely party character throughout the state. So, uh, what do you expect Democrats to do? And uh, did Abraham Lincoln, a lifelong politician, the veteran of many, many similar election cycles in the past, did he, of all people, need to be warned that the Democrats were going to run? And I, I've, I used to dismiss this letter, and I think I was wrong. Uh, at least I, I, this is what I think. I think Lincoln did need a wake-up call. Uh, Trumbull himself was no stranger to politics, and he seemed surprised that the Democrats were organizing. Uh, and Republicans, many of them, seem to uh, think that the Democrats were not going to exert themselves much for partisan purposes during this great war. And if you look at the election returns from 1862, they certainly suggest uh, that what happened uh, in those elections was this. The Democrats did make their usual effort, and the Republicans did not. Uh, and now I, I'm going to give you uh, uh, just one result. Uh, I know election results after lunch are not great. So uh, <laughs> one result uh, from Lincoln's home state, Illinois. Uh, the Republican vote in Illinois uh, in 1862 fell off about 30% from its 1860 level. Uh, the Democratic vote fell off about 15% from the 1860 figure. Now, these were off-year elections, and we expect a decline in turnout in those years. In the 19th century, the average decline from presidential election to off-year election, according to Joel Silby, was about 13%. So the Democrats, at at 15% off, they turned in their usual performance. Uh, uh, and the Republicans, though, fell by double. So there are results from other states, but that'll suffice. It looks almost as if the Republicans collapsed in 1862, but they didn't. They simply didn't try. They didn't think they had to. They were thinking hoping, dreaming that party divisions might be over for the duration of the contest. Well, the Democrats never dreamed such a thing. Uh, they were at least as energetic as usual in 1862 while the Republicans were dozing. After the election was over, Republicans wrote President Lincoln to complain about what he had let occur in the 1862 elections. Carl Schurz uh, wrote him and said, quote, too many Republicans either voted against you or withheld their votes, unquote. Now, withheld their votes means they stayed at home, the, didn't get excited about the election. Or, uh, again, Senator John Sherman of Ohio, who was as blunt speaking as his brother, the general, all right, uh, told the president that, that he, the president, Lincoln, had, quote, voluntarily abandoned, unquote, the Republicans 
and left them, quote, to run against an old, well-drilled party organization. Uh, Sherman told Lincoln, uh, this is an election post-mortem, uh, that it had been a mistake not to have had ward meetings and local party committee meetings and party conventions and the trappings of the Republicans making a serious effort. Well, that's 1862. In 1863, Lincoln had learned his lesson. He performed a major about face in terms of political effort. He did almost nothing in 1862. In 1863, he did a lot. He wrote two of his most famous pieces of lethal political pamphleteering. Uh, James G. Randall calls them state papers, but don't be fooled by that. Uh, they, 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 what came to be called the Corning Letter, that was about the Vallandigham arrest. Uh, that was written June 12th, published June 12th, 1863. And the Conkling Letter, uh, later that summer, August 26, 1863. Uh, you'll notice that he issued the Corning uh, letter the day after Vallandigham got the nomination for uh, governor of Ohio. Uh, he followed it up with yet a third, um, I mean another Ohio uh, letter, a pretty much nakedly politicking letter, to members of the Ohio Democratic Nominating Convention. As far as I can can tell the Corning letter is the longest political letter Lincoln ever wrote. Anyway, it's very long. Uh, the other letter to Ohio was about half as long as the Corning letter. And if you put them together, uh, I, I, roughly uh, speaking, there were about six. He devoted about six thousand words uh, to Ohio that election summer in 1863. Now, if he'd done that for all the states in the North, uh, 23 of them, uh, he would have written 138,000 words. Uh, uh, that's a book. Presidents don't have time to write books. Uh, it would have been about 500 pages in manuscript, a 300-page printed book. Uh, he didn't do that. But for Ohio, he gave Ohio that part of a book uh, because Ohio was really important. The third letter, the Conkling letter in 1863, was also long, uh, uh, um, about 1,800 words maybe, uh, and compared to the Corning letter, which is about 4,000, I think. Uh, but uh, the point is uh, that he wrote, uh, he paid attention to these uh, states, he paid attention to the elections in the 1830. In 1863, and as for distribution, well, uh, one of the estimates of the distribution of the Corning letter is that it was printed in half a million copies. Now, that's what Abraham Lincoln does when he's paying attention to a political campaign. I'm not saying that the Republicans won in 1863 because Lincoln did pay attention, but what Lincoln did, I think, was representative of and symbolic of the overall Republican effort in 1863, uh, which was much greater than in 62. The party was awake in 1863. I guess I should say, in keeping with the times, it was wide awake. <laughs> well, after the elections were over in October 1863, um, the Secretary of the Navy, Gideon Wells, dropped by uh, Lincoln's office to congratulate him on the Republican uh, victories. And Wells uh, found uh, Lincoln, and, and I'm going to quote from Wells' famous diary here after this visit. He found him in good spirits and greatly relieved from the depression of yesterday. He told me he had more anxiety in regard to the election results of yesterday than he had in 1860 when he was chosen. He could not, he said, have believed four years ago that one genuine American would or could be induced to vote for such a man as Vallandigham. Yet he had been made the candidate of a large party, their representative man, and had received a vote that is a discredit to this country. The president showed a good deal of emotion as he dwelt on this subject, and his regrets were sincere. So, what can we conclude from this? Uh, I think the most important conclusion is that the size of the peace wing of the Democratic Party has been greatly exaggerated. How much has it been exaggerated? Well, if we took as a sort of rule of thumb an example from uh, 1863, 
we can say it's been exaggerated threefold. They were one-third the size you think they were. Uh, historians have thought there were three peace candidates in 1863, but there was only one. The peace wing uh, was not nearly as strong as we've been made to think. Second, I would say that the sharp contrast in the president's behavior between 1862 and 1863 reveals, uh, to me at any rate, a very surprising Lincoln. Not the greatest politician of his age, but in fact a politician with a spotty record, I pardon a pun, uh, who could perform very well, but who didn't always perform. And third, and finally, to me, I think, uh, uh, maybe overall the most important point, I think we can see that the political history of the Civil War is in need of a rewrite based on careful attention to the very different election cycle and election calendar of the 19th century. Thanks. So I can take questions if you have them. Yes, hello. Um, is this on? Doesn't sound like it. <laughs> now it is. Yeah, often we uh, see Lincoln portrayed as a, a dictator, you know, because of civil liberties and the changes that were made in the Civil War. And of course, we know there were uh, substantial. Uh, draft riots, particularly amongst the Irish in New York. But um, my question is about the suspension of habeas corpus. Why was there never really much in the way of, you know, substantial violent resistance to habeas corpus or, you know, even mass protest? Why didn't that really ever happen? Oh, well, that's a great question. And, and in fact, actually, that's, that recapitulates uh, the question I was asking myself when I started to write The Fate of Liberty, which is about the, the civil liberties in the Lincoln administration. And uh, I had seen uh, what uh, a protest against the Vietnam War uh, could do uh, and uh, what disturbance uh, 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 th they could bring and what reaction. And I thought, well, the Lincoln administration is supposed to have made all of these arbitrary arrests. And you had the idea that before elections, critical elections, they rounded up Democrats, uh, and then after the election, let them go. Uh, and that uh, uh, you know, e editors and, and politicians on the stump so that, that had been silenced. And I thought, well, if anything like the estimated number, which was in the tens of thousands, if anything like that uh, had occurred, what, there would have been violence in the streets. Uh, and, uh, yay, probably revolution in the North. Uh, so at that point I decided that, well, the people who got arrested must not, must not be uh, the kinds of people that we think of automatically when we think of suppression of civil liberties in time of war. Uh, uh, that is uh, what they call them now, dissenters. Yeah. All right. Uh, that in fact, uh, that it just couldn't have been that many. And so uh, I decided to see, look and see who, who, who did get arrested. Um, I called it doing constitutional history from the bottom up. Uh, you know, I was interested in, in prisoners in jail and not in judges. Judges bore me. So uh, I, uh, I, I looked, and the, I mean, the key lies in who got arrested uh, and in terminology. Uh, these people on the rolls are listed as state prisoners. Uh, but they ca that can be anything from a Democratic newspaper editor uh, to somebody from the occupied South who has been uh, uh, arrested for, well, you know, pretty good reasons. Uh, and uh, in, in fact, that is the key to see uh, that, well, one, that the number of the number of Democratic editors, prominent Democrats and so forth that are arrested is not anything like uh, what 
you, you might have imagined, and that the uh, other arrests, which were of suspected blockade runners and uh, you name it, that that, that was really the, the bulk of them. Uh, so in, in, uh, that was really what that, meant was, that book was meant to answer, was to say, well, if the arrests looked like we imagined they did, uh, why didn't we get violence in the streets? And the, the answer was, uh, they didn't look like what we imagined. Thank you. Hello. Um, I enjoyed your talk. I also have enjoyed two of your earlier books, the Lincoln biography and um, your revisionist military history that talks about how the Civil War was not as a total war as it's sometimes called. Um, on the talk you gave today, um, you began by talking about McClellan and his plat and how his um, platform differed from McClellan, the candidate. Uh, it seems to me that that fact, which is obviously correct, runs against uh, your conclusion in your paper because uh, the Democratic Party peace wing, well, perhaps overrated, was certainly strong enough in 1864 to dictate not only the vice presidential candidate that McClellan ran with, but also the platform to the great detriment of uh, McClellan in 1864. Also, the fact that politically there was so much sentiment in 1864 for a secession of uh, an end of the war, given that uh, the military campaigns temp, uh, looked to be at a hiatus and not going anywhere in front of Atlanta and elsewhere until the breakthrough. So it seems to me that these factors show contrary to these three elections in 1863, that the peace movement in the Democratic Party was indeed very formidable. Right, these are very penetrating questions, I'll have to say. Uh, and, uh, uh, and I will, at this point, hide behind. Um, some of the people who are speaking here are speaking about books they've already written. I'm, reading, I'm speaking about one I am writing. Uh, and I don't have all the answers yet. Uh, and I am puzzled by some of the same things uh, you are. So uh, my ability to answer that is uh, uh, not as uh, great as I hope it will be uh, soon. Uh, but about M M McClellan's uh, uh, nomination and the peace plank uh, of the Democratic Party, uh, the national peace plank in 1864, uh, it's obvious that what happened is the Democrats, um, it seems to me what's obvious, that the Democrats were following a fairly common pattern of giving the uh, candidate to one wing of the party and the platform to the other wing of the party. Um, and in this instance, well, that was a very bad idea. Uh, and uh, furthermore, I don't think there are two things that would have prevented them from uh, doing that. Uh, and, well, uh, the most important one uh, is that uh, they, if they'd held their convention just a couple of days later, uh, and they'd heard the news from Atlanta too, uh, there would probably wouldn't have been a peace wing, in it, uh, a peace platform in the Democratic Party to embarrass George McClellan. Uh, and the other thing is, I, I was trying to lay the ground for it a little here today, uh, and that is that because the um, Ohio Democrats nominated a civil liberties candidate who personally had peace credentials and then rallied around and defended a peace candidate, it tended to exaggerate in the minds of Democrats elsewhere in the nation how strong the peace wing of the party was. And so that in Chicago, they gave them too much. Uh, and uh, can I prove that? No. I, uh, <laughs> alas, uh, I, the, uh, the convention is just a, a sort of closed book to me I, I, about exactly what went on in the convention that the Peace Democrats could uh, get so much. Uh, but at any rate, that's my uh, hunch uh, that, uh, about the, the, uh, that not what to me is the anomaly of a peace platform in the, in the party in 
1864, and asked for uh, the strength of the peace movement being exaggerated, well, there are all kinds of proofs of that after McClellan is nominated, not the least of them McClellan himself, who repudiates his own platform. Uh, and then uh, are there numerous Democrats who say, well, I like the platform, but not the candidate? Not very many. Uh, they, after that, they toe the line. Uh, and so it, I, I, uh, I'm convinced the peace movement has been greatly exaggerated, but it, uh, it, the, its exact role, I mean, as I say, a penetrating question, its exact role in August and September of 1864, I'm still working. Um, you have that question and your answer is basically torpedoed my own question <laughs> to some degree. But I was, I, I'm curious about the fact that the vice presidential nominee was George Pendleton of Ohio, and so in 1864. So I'm wondering two things, how closely allied were Vallandigham and Pendleton, and whether, what or how, uh, what, is, it, is, it, is it the fact that Ohio then, as now, was a swing state, leads to Pendleton's nomination. So I'm just trying to figure out the, the politics of Vallandigham, Ohio, and Pendleton as the vice presidential nominee. So, Yeah. Oh, uh, another very good question to which I don't have a very good answer. Uh, but I would say that uh, uh, you have in part answered your own question. Ohio was important. Uh, and, you know, I have, I have, uh, I've been working on political history for, uh, what, 40 years, something like that? And I have never read a letter uh, uh, about selecting a vice presidential candidate which mentioned his credentials for the presidency. Uh, that, is, uh, that, that, that wasn't the point. Uh, the point was always, what would he bring to the ticket? Uh, and uh, so uh, this is a kind of a typical scenario then. I mean, Pendleton was, a, uh, was another um, great burden that McClellan had to bear, the platform, the vice presidential candidate, uh, and, uh, and it's uh, illustrative of that uh, point, uh, that uh, they, they really think about, well, what is the, what is the vice, uh, what is the candidate going to bring to the ticket? Ohio, uh, and they don't think much farther than that, and they should. Uh, again, uh, this is a question that it may be uh, obviated by what has gone before, uh, but just to be certain, the received wisdom, of course, is that the victories at Vicksburg and uh, Gettysburg uh, turn the tide uh, in terms of the, the uh, in, in terms of the projection for the coming election next year, that it had, not, had, had it not been that, that uh, the Republican Party would have been in dire straits. But what you're saying is that, um, uh, that, that, the, that the Republican Party was doing very well up to that point. Uh, so are we to assume that uh, militarily, of course, that they were of great importance, but that they weren't of this great importance uh, politically as uh, we are led to believe? Yeah, it's uh, again another uh, good question and a difficult one to answer. Uh, it is important to contextualize the election results uh, by the events in the war, uh, but you can overdo it on the one hand. And so, if I think that the the uh, Democratic um, the members of the Democratic convention in Pennsylvania met in Harrisburg. Um, when they came, the Republicans that year, because of the invasion of the state, they postponed their nominating convention. Um, but the Democrats w went ahead and held theirs, and I think, you know, as the Democratic delegates streamed into Harrisburg, they were met by refugees fleeing Harrisburg, because no one knew where Robert E. Lee might go uh, in an invasion of the North, and Harrisburg was a very likely target. They're packing up the Pennsylvania archives, the state archives uh, from the government to leave, and the Democrats are pouring in. And so that's a clue that, uh, yeah, you've got to con contextualize it with military events, but the politicians, uh, uh, they march to some of their own rhythms. Uh, all right. Uh, on the other hand, I don't think, you, uh, just to balance the picture, uh, you cannot um, overestimate the degree to which the Democrats didn't want to say anything 
1864 until it was clearer which way the war was going. Uh, and the Democratic Party line in 1864, uh, and I, I could cite any number of uh, people who said this, the Democratic Party line in 1864 is, uh, look, we're an opposition party. We don't have to say what we stand for. That's their line. <laughs> it's the administration that has to say what it stands for. Uh, we don't have to do that. Uh, and so they are clearly uh, wanting to sit on the fence and wait and see how events turn out. So on the, you know, there is, there's evidence both ways. And what that um, illustrates for me uh, is something I've just, I'm sure you don't need a reminder of this, but every now and then I do. Uh, and, and that is what a huge, speaking of 1864, what a gigantic, sprawling, difficult thing it is to get your hands on an American presidential election. The sources for it are vast, uh, and the differing viewpoints are many. Uh, and it is, uh, uh, you want to realize when you read a book about the election of 1864, or if you read mine about the Democratic Party in, uh, in the Civil War, uh, that, uh, boy, a whole lot of sifting has gone on uh, in there. And, uh, 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 and that what we're trying to do is balance off these uh, uh, different impulses of explanation. Okay, thank you.